Well, hello, everyone. It's so good to see you. My name is Pastor Jason. I'm one of the pastors here at Hope Church, and I'm so thankful that you have chosen to worship with us this morning. We're in the midst of a, a global pandemic that has been taking place for a long time. And I know you might be thinking that I'm talking about COVID-19 or influenza, and yes, those are, those are health issues that we are still continuing to address. But there's been a global pandemic that has been taking place for, for generation after generation. And that is the pandemic of, of grumbling and criticism. It's a pandemic because it, uh, it takes over. And it's a pandemic because it impacts and affects everyone around it. Grumbling and criticism can be contagious. And it happens, uh, when, when it happens among God's people, the fundamental symptom of it, the fundamental cause of why you and I are prone to grumbling and complaining is that we question if God is good and if He is going to continue to be faithful in the future just as He has been faithful in the past. And when I say it's a pandemic, it is a pandemic that we've been fighting for generations. In fact, Israel was fighting it just after God had redeemed them out of Egypt. God has brought them out of Egypt, and uh, he, has, he has led them through the wilderness. He has, uh, or he's, he has guided them uh, out, out of Egypt. He is leading them while they are in the wilderness. He leads them to the Red Sea. And while they are there, they begin to grumble. Then God leads them across the Red, the Red Sea on dry ground and consumes their enemies people of God go to a place called Mara, which we talked about last week, a place called bitterness. And you know what they did there? They grumbled. But God provided water. Uh, God, provi God turned bitter water sweet. And so the last few weeks, we've been learning that, um, that God's people oftentimes grumble. And when they grumble, when we grumble, God still guides. This morning, we're going to look at a repetition of grumbling. God's people are in the wilderness, and they're in the wilderness, and they're hungry. And so they began to do what you and I do when we get hangry. You know, not hungry, but just hangry. They begin to grumble, and they do it repetitively. And in the midst of all this grumbling, in spite of all the grumbling, God provides food for them. He's going to provide manna every day, and He is going to provide water from a rock. And it is a reminder that, um, that God not only guides, but it, when you and I are at the end of our resources, we're at the end of our wits, we're at the end of our strength, that God provides. So let me show you in Exodus chapter 16, in Exodus chapter 17, real quickly, three ways that we see God provided for His people. Three ways that God provided for His people by giving them this, uh, this, 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 this bread and water. The, the first thing we notice, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to say the point and then we'll read it. The first thing that we notice is that God provides graciously to His people. That, in, that means God gives to His people that don't deserve it. L listen to how God words it. He says, verse 4, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a portion every day that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. On a sixth day when they prepare and they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. So Moses and Aaron said to the people of Israel, At evening you shall know that it is the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord because he has heard your grumbling against the Lord. For what are we that you grumble against us? And Moses said, the Lord gives you in the evening meat to eat and in the morning bread to the full because the Lord has heard your grumbling. Watch this. That you grumble against him. What are we? Your grumbling, he says, is not against us, but it against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, say to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, come near before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. The first thing we notice about the, the goodness of God and the provision of God is God gives graciously, and by that I mean He gives to people that don't deserve it. God, God, gives, God gives bread to the people that, 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 that they didn't deserve it. They didn't work for the bread, and they didn't have a good attitude about the, about the bread, 
and they actually were questioning what God has done and what Moses has done. In fact, earlier, uh, earlier in the passage, it says that they began to say, that they, they began to tell Moses that, uh, you, you know, back when we were in Egypt, we sat around all these pots of meats and, um, and, 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 and we had bread to the full, but you brought us out here in the wilderness to die. When you, and I, when you and I grumble, when you and I complain, we have a tendency to forget the goodness of God. And, and what we will do is we will, we will look at things out of context. They weren't sitting around pots of meat. They didn't have bread to their fill. Their fill. They, 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 they were in bondage in Egypt. That's why they left in the first place. But because life got hard, they, uh, they, they remembered the past differently than it really was. The past has always a sense of nostalgia. Especially when things aren't going today to the way that we wish they would. And it can be easy to, to long for the time of the past, even when the past wasn't all that great. More than that, they began to question Moses. They began to, uh, they began to uh, say to Moses that he wanted to lead them out into the wilderness so that they would die. That's what grumbling does. It causes us to question those that have our best intentions. And it also causes us to, uh, to remember the past differently than when it really was. And do you know what God does to people that grumble? He provides for them. In the same way parents provide for their children when their children are not always appreciative. When God provides, God provides graciously, and by that I mean He provides to those that don't deserve it. There, there's a second thing that we see that God, provi way God provides. Not only does He provide graciously, but God provides sufficiently. God provides sufficiently. By sufficient, God is going to provide everything that they need. It says here that God provides them, God provides them uh, them, the, the manna in the morning. They didn't know what this manna was. In fact, the word manna literally means in Hebrew, what is it? They wake up, they come, they, they, they wake up and they, they go outside and the, the, the ground is covered with this, uh, with this flaky stuff, kind of almost like flour. And they're able to eat, they're able to eat manna. And then, and, and then God had did that six days of the week for the entire time that they were in the wilderness. God's provision was sufficient. He gave them everything that they need. And it's, it's interesting, the text, says, the text says that one of the things that God did is that uh, He told them, He said, listen, take what you need for today and don't keep any over. Because if you keep any over, it's going to spoil and it's going to get rotten and it's going to get worms and and, and, but distrust me, tomorrow there's going, to be, there's going to be more. And as you can imagine, what people did is they took everything they needed for the day and then they packed some away so that they would have some the next day. And what happened to that which they packed away? It began to spoil. It began to get worms. It began to get nasty. Because God wanted to teach them this principle. That is, that God would provide for their needs day by day. In fact, verse 21 says, Morning by morning they gathered it, as much as he, as he could eat, but when the sun grew hot, it melted. Every single morning, for those six days, for six days every week, God would provide everything that they need. And to be greedy and to hoard it and to keep it is, is, a, is a symptom of not trusting that God would be faithful the next day as He has in the past. God's provision for them was sufficient. And that lets us know, that, that, that reminds us, we don't always have to have the future figured out. We don't always have to have everything taken care of today in order for tomorrow to be prosperous. Sometimes God is going to lead us day by day, and, and God will give us all the grace that we need. In fact, Pastor Larry says that God gives us enough grace each day to do what He has called us to do or to endure what we have to endure. But He doesn't give us tomorrow's grace today and He doesn't give us yesterday's grace to, to, today as well. Each day, God gives us a sufficient amount of grace. They had everything that they needed 
each day. But as I reminded, as I, as I was saying that God gives it to us, He's sufficient, uh, that there was one day of the week that there was not manna. I'm sorry, there was not manna on the ground. God had told them on the sixth day to gather twice as much so that on the seventh day they could rest. Now this is important for a number of reasons. This is the first time we ever see the concept of Sabbath in Scripture. We don't see it in Genesis and we don't see it in Exodus up until now. And that's significant for two reasons. Number one, first reason it's significant is remember they just came out of slavery in Egypt. So they know very, very little about rest. They, 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 in, in Egypt, they had to work when the taskmaster told them to work. They had, they had their quota lift, their, their, their quota raised. They, they always had to, to do something and to do something more. Now God is telling them on every seventh day, they're going to rest. And in fact, he is going to not provide food on that seventh day so that that day specifically can be set aside for him. That was, that was mind-blowing to a nation that had just come out of slavery. But not only is, is, does he tell them to rest, um, not only do they rest from the bondage of, of, of Egypt, but even more so, they, um, e e even more so, they, they are reminded that what they have, they have not worked for. Working harder is not, not going to get them more manna. They get more manna just simply because God has been gracious to them. And the Sabbath was the reminder of that. So God provides for them very graciously because they didn't deserve it. And He provides for them sufficiently because they had all they needed. One more thing we see in this passage is that God provides for them eternally. God provides for them eternally. Let me, let me show you where we see it here and later in Scripture. In verse 31, it says, Now the house of Israel called its name manna. It was like the, the, the coriander seed, white, and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. And Moses said, This is what the Lord has commanded. Let an omer be kept throughout the generations, so that you may see the bread with which I fed you in the wilderness, when I brought you out of the land of Egypt. And Moses said to Aaron, take a jar and put omer in it, omer of manna in it, uh, omer of manna in it, and place it before the Lord to be kept throughout the generations. As the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron placed it before the testimony to be kept. And the people of Israel made the man, ate the manna forty years till they came to the to the uh, habitable land, and they ate manna till they came to the border of the land of Canaan. And he says the omer is the tenth part of the ephah. He had them take a jar. And to put, a, um, put some manna in it so that they would remember in the future what God had brought them from and how God had provided it in, how God had provided for them when they were wandering in the wilderness. It was a continual reminder of the faithfulness of God. But let me show you where, where Jesus uh, is. Let me show you where Jesus talks about this manna. In, in John chapter 6, Jesus is talking about how he is, is uh, the bread of life. In John chapter 6, Jesus says that he is the, his, he is the bread of life. Listen to, listen to how he, he describes it. John chapter 6, verse 48, he says, I am the bread of life. Jesus is saying to his people, your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that no one may eat of it and not die. Then Jesus says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I give him for life, for the life of the world is my flesh. And Jesus is saying that... Uh, the manna in the wilderness was from heaven. And it fed you. And it sustained you. And it kept you. And you could always count on it. It was everything you need. It was nothing that you worked for. And it was given to you completely by, by God, from by the Father from heaven. And Jesus says, that, uh, 
that they ate that, but eventually they died. But Jesus says, I am the, he, he says, I am the bread of life. I am the living bread. That my life, my death, my sacrifice for you is what will enable you to not only be sustained this day, but to be sustained for eternity. Jesus is saying, just as they had manna in the wilderness that they didn't deserve to sustain them, so, God, so, so Jesus is the bread of life that will sustain every generation afterward. In fact, every generation ever. That Jesus is that bread of life so that they have eternal life. The manna in the wilderness pointed forward to Jesus. And Jesus, when He explained who He was as the bread of life, pointed back to the manna as a foreshadowing of what He would do for His people. But you know what? It's one thing to have something to eat but not have anything to drink. So Israel began to, cr began to grumble again. They began to be frustrated because their glasses weren't filled fast enough. And so Moses, in these next few verses, deals with Israel as they're quarreling, quarreling again. Listen to what happens. It's all the con verse, uh, chapter 17, verse 1. All the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness by stages according to the commandment of the Lord. That's interesting there. God leads his people oftentimes by stages. Uh, and, and encamped at uh, Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore, watch this again. The people quarreled with Moses. and said, give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? The people thirsted there for water. And the people grumbled against Moses and said, why did you bring us out of Egypt? Watch this to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst. Like Moses didn't have anything better to do than lead the people out of Egypt, lead them two, two, and, a, two and a half months into the wilderness just so that they could run out of water and, and, uh, and, and die of thirst. Yeah, that, 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 that's exactly what Moses was trying to do, wasn't it? Moses cried to the Lord, What shall I do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said, Pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel. Take in your hand the staff which you struck the Nile and go. He says, Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock. The water shall come of it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders. And he called the name of the place Massa, which means testing, and Meribah, which means quarreling. Because the quarreling of the people of Israel, because the Lord tested him by saying, is the Lord among us? So, How does God provide refreshment for his people? He tells Moses to take the staff and to strike the rock. And when he strikes the rock, the water comes out. It's, a, it, it's, it's not just a great uh, fountain but it is a picture of Jesus. Moses only has to strike the, one, the rock once because by striking the rock once, the water, the water flowed. In the New Testament, Jesus is the living water. In, in, the, in the New Testament, uh, Jesus was struck on behalf of His people. That just as Moses struck the rock, and when the struck the rock, the waters flowed. In the same way, Jesus, in the same way, Jesus was struck when he hung on the cross. Jesus was struck by the Father, and so when the Father struck Jesus, when Jesus, when I'm sorry, when, when when Jesus was struck on the cross, when Jesus was struck, what Jesus did is Jesus absorbed the strike in order that everybody could have the refreshment and the salvation that they needed. The bread and the water in the Old Testament was from God, established by God, given by God, uh, commanded by God to strike. And in and, and the New Testament, and what we see in the life of Jesus is the same thing. That Jesus is this bread of life that is available to all people. And that Jesus was struck. And when Jesus was struck by the, by the rod of the judgment of God, 
And salvation was granted to His people. It was at the cross where that took place. It was at the cross where Jesus was struck. It was at the cross where, uh, where they hung Him high and they stretched Him wide. It was at the cross. It was at the cross where He cried out, My God, My God, why have Thou forsaken Me? It was at the cross that the Father turned His face away. It was at the cross that Jesus' body was, was likewise struck with a sword and blood and water flowed. It was at that cross where Jesus was struck for your sins and my sins. We used to sing at the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light. At the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light and the burdens of my heart rolled away, it was there by faith that I received my sight. Now I'm happy all the day. At the cross, Jesus was struck and the salvation flowed from Him. God provides in ways that are gracious. God provides in ways that are sufficient. God provides in ways that are eternal. Father, we sing that hymn that says, And alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my Sovereign die, would He devote that sacred head to such a worm as I? Jesus, I thank you that you were struck. The rod of judgment struck you. And that you provided salvation to those that were responsible for your death. I thank you, Father, for your... that you were the bread of heaven. Thank you, Jesus, that you were the bread of heaven. that you satisfy us. And so we want for nothing that you can't provide. And so we want for nothing, Lord, that you, that you would provide for us. Father, this week we celebrate Thanksgiving. We celebrate the abundance that you have blessed us with. And we're reminded, Lord, that, uh, that we give thanks for these things because they come from you. The blessings of this holiday, the, um, the bread from heaven, the water from a rock, and the salvation that only you provide. Lord, we look to you with great hope and great thanksgiving. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Well, I want to thank you for uh, joining us again uh, this morning. Hope you have a great holiday coming up. I want to let you know that uh, you can find out more about Hope Church by going to our website, www.hopeanddayton.org. While you're there, you can give up your tithes and your gifts and your offerings. Uh, you could also do, th do that through our Hope in Dayton app. Be sure to download that if you've not done so. Uh, and then also you can give through our text to give. And of course, you can join us here at our Wilmington Pike location. We're so excited. Hope you have a great weekend. And uh, we look forward to, to seeing you next week. Until then, Lord bless. He led me out of the desert, brought me into his streams, river of living water, turned my bed.